Make up mine. The chainsaw, a weapon as brutal as it is fantastical. In real life, using a chainsaw directly in combat is a surefire way to either get killed or kill yourself given how large, unruly, and hard to manage they are, but in the world of video games, anything is possible. Just like in movies, chainsaws are the preferred weapons of psycho killers and action heroes everywhere, and in this video, I wanted to try and name my personal picks for the 6 best chainsaw users in video games. Why 6? Because it looks better in a YouTube title than 5. That said, let's roll. In the blood-soaked, neon-drenched world of Hotline Miami, the sight of characters wielding unrealistic weapons in dire situations is very, very common. Between Biker specializing in cleavers and throwing knives, Tony wielding only his fists, and Jacket's extremely wide array of weapons, it's just a day in the life of an average 1980s Miami citizen. Out of all of them, though, the most standout character in Hotline Miami weapons-wise would have to be one who sort of blends into a crowd, but is still extremely notable all the same. Murderer by night, a member of the fans, and one of two sadistic swans, Alex Davis. Alex is a member of a group of playable Hotline Miami 2 characters known as The Fans, a set of overzealous vigilantes who've made it their goal to follow in the footsteps of the first game's protagonist, Jacket. And by that, I mean mass murdering criminals and mobsters. However, whereas Jacket had personal stake in his killings and was being goaded by the 50 Blessings organization, The Fans are acting purely independently, basically as a bunch of half-baked imitators who lack any of the personal context behind Jacket's killings. The entire group served in an alternate past war alongside Jacket in 1985, and and found themselves lacking purpose and direction in their lives after the battle was over. After Jacket's murder sprees were over and were made public knowledge in Miami, however, the fans found a new, albeit misguided, purpose in life, filling the mass murderer-shaped hole in Miami's heart and committing some street-style vigilantism. As for Alex specifically, she's characterized by her extremely close, codependent relationship with her brother Ash, to the point that they exclusively commit their murders together and her enthusiasm for the things around her. She can be seen present at Jacket's trial, protesting his prosecution, foolishly recommends calling their local news station for a copy of a story about their own murders, and sets in motion at least one of the fans' killing sprees. Like the rest of the fans, she's shown to be out of her element and killing for the wrong reasons, seeking self-gratification and publicity rather than any of the nuanced causes for Jacket's murders. There's obviously not too many right reasons to commit murder, but the fans acted out of purely selfish motives compared to the man they were trying to imitate. Eventually, Alex and the other fans incidentally find out about a large gathering of mobsters at a local skyscraper, and short-sightedly set out for what they believe will be their biggest job yet. However, things go south fast, with different members going silent and failing to answer their walkie-talkies, culminating in all of their deaths, including Alex and Ash. Kind of sad, but they really got themselves into it. In terms of gameplay, Alex and Ash are unique in the Hotline Miami series in that they're the only playable set of duo characters, with the player controlling Alex and Ash following closely behind at all times. While Ash wields a pistol that can be manually aimed and fired by the player, Alex balances them out by wielding a fucking chainsaw. This allows her to instantly kill any standing enemy and unlike other melee weapons in the game which can be dropped or replaced after a while, Alex exclusively wields her chainsaw, giving her permanent access to a powerful two-handed weapon. This, combined with Ash's pistol, makes the pair one of the most balanced and well-suited characters in the series for dealing with multiple situations. Alex also has access to a few exclusive execution mechanics on enemies, which between their animations and sound design are very... Yeah, definitely one of the more extra in the series. Considering that each of the fans have a unique weapon or skill, Alex's choice of weapon being a chainsaw might also reflect her personality, with her overzealous and enthusiastic nature combined with it being reflections of some deep-seated aggression. Or maybe not so deep-seated. Regardless, whereas the fan story is fairly short-lived in Hotline Miami 2, only lasting about half of the game, and Alex's set of skills might be limited compared to other characters on the list, she's still a notable and interesting enough chainsaw user to scrape her way onto this list. Consider her and Ash like a more sadistic version of the Ice Climbers from Smash. Or maybe less sadistic, I'm not sure.
In the endless pantheon of controversial video games, you can definitely gleam a few patterns between the ones that truly stand out. If it's not a straight up creepy porn game, it's likely a hyper violent power fantasy with a focus on realistic gore with some good old baseless edge thrown in. Out of every game to be deemed controversial or to attract public outrage though, few stand out to me as much as Manhunt. Despite being relatively pedestrian by today's standards, this 2003 Rockstar developed game caused an absolute media firestorm when it was first released, being banned in several countries is getting extreme heat from major outlets, and interestingly, being supposedly linked to a real-life murder. The primary source of the game's controversies lie at its premise, which sees the player character Cash competing to be the best performer in a snuff film ring, and in its at-the-time brutally realistic violence. Despite the game being much more than just a mindless, senseless, glorified killing, that's what a lot of its detractors tended to paint it as. And it's fortunate that most of those media fearmongers didn't really know anything about the game beyond this, because I can tell you they would have had a field day if they played through enough of the game game to reach Pigsy. Pigsy serves as the penultimate boss of Manhunt, and despite his fairly later appearance in the game, has gone on to be one of its most iconic and memorable characters. An overweight, mentally challenged cannibal wearing a severed pig's head as a mask, Pigsy served as the top star of Starkweather, the game's main villain, snuff film ring prior to the player character's introduction. He starred in several high-profile and successful snuff films, and was used as the ring's main means of corpse disposal through his cannibalism. Unfortunately, Pigsy would eventually fall out of favor with Starkweather, primarily due to how dangerous and unpredictable he was, and was eventually chained up in the attic of Starkweather's estate, being fed corpses to keep him sustained. During the final stages of Manhunt's story, the player-controlled Cash storms Starkweather's estate intent on killing him, with his mission being made significantly harder by an escaped chainsaw-wielding Pigsy. Pigsy successfully killed all of Starkweather's heavily armed Cerberus guards, and has his sights set on the player character, Cash. From here, the player engages Pigsy in a sort of two-way game of cat and mouse, with the two chasing and avoiding each other in equal measure. Pigsy's strength makes him immune to direct damage, by any of the player's traditional means, and his chainsaw is strong enough to kill the player in a few seconds if they're caught out. Because of this, the player has to rely on sneak attacks, hiding around the estate and luring Pigsy in for executions and heavy cinematic attacks. The player can't get too comfortable though, since Pigsy can sniff them out and find their location due to his animalistic nature. All of this results in a constant push and pull between the player and Pigsy, with the player needing to stay close enough to him to secure sneak attacks without doing anything to fully attract his attention. It's a unique fight as far as stealth mechanics go, with Pigsy and Cash both simultaneously simultaneously being the predator and the prey. Also, and this might sound weird, but I've always viewed Pigsy as a kind of tragic character, since he's clearly mentally handicapped to some extent and was forced into this awful, exploitative, horrific world rather than getting the kind of help he could have used. It's low-key depressing and kind of realistic. Anyways, by the end of the fight, the player finds a means to kill Pigsy in using his own size against him and having him step onto a shaking grate that causes him to plummet to his death. An unceremonious death for such a gratuitous character. It's not all sad though, since the player is a able to arm themselves with Pigsy's chainsaw and use it to put an end to Starkweather personally. Overall, Pigsy is one of the more disturbing parts of an infamously graphic and disturbing game, and a big part of that is his weapon of choice. Makes me wonder though, how far those outrage media outlets actually played into the game if they never had anything to say about this. The opening few minutes of Resident Evil 4 are among my favorite beginning sections of any video game ever. Not only do they perfectly establish the premise, tone, and style that the game will be going for, but they're also extremely effective in gameplay, thrusting the player into an extremely intense opening gauntlet against waves of Ganados, the game's zombies, with an entire village as their backdrop. The music, waves of enemies, and pressure alone will be enough to get the player's nerves racked, but as soon as they think they've found some respite in the form of a locked cabin and a free shotgun, he shows up. Resident Evil 4 features a few chainsaw wielders, but none of them are as iconic or noteworthy as Dr. Salvador. Appearing right at the beginning of the game, he's a lumbering brute of a ganado boasting insane defenses, a seemingly bottomless health pool, and most notably, a chainsaw. Whenever Dr. Salvador shows up, the player's first priority should always be to keep him as far away from them as possible, as allowing him to close the distance will result in a brutal instant kill death with a fitting animation. This animation is so graphic that it's actually censored in the Japanese version of the game under Japanese law forbidding depiction 
conditions of decapitation in media. The most dangerous thing about Dr. Salvador is his ability to sneak up on the player, since if you don't have him in your field of view yet you know he's somewhere in the area, you've gotta have eyes in the back of your head lest he sneaks up behind you and instantly kills you while you're focusing something else. His presence in any area is telegraphed by his distinctive chainsaw sound, which is kind of helpful but to be honest just makes him even scarier. And the best part is that despite Salvador's most famous appearance being in the game's opening, he shows up multiple times throughout the game. The game loves throwing him at the player during what are likely the worst times to encounter him, like during a hectic minecart section, during a puzzle that requires darting between different areas very quickly, or most notably during a fight against another differently dressed Dr. Salvador. Speaking of that, there's a popular and interesting fan theory that prescribes to the belief that every normal Salvador the player fights in the game is the same one, which is backed by the fact that he's the only non-boss enemy that doesn't melt into goo after the player defeats him. He just lays there, motionless, waiting for his next chance to strike. This theory is also helped by a brief note in the trial version of Resident Evil 4, where we get a small glimpse at his face alongside the implication that he may be immortal. Well, whether or not he's a single powerful entity, or a group of identical chainsaw-wielding Ganados, Dr. Salvador will always be one of the most memorable parts of one of the best games of all time. Hell, he's such a big deal that he even got top billing on the game's incredible EU box art. Here's hoping for big things in the remake. When it comes to talking about characters who fight with a certain kind of weapon in video games, one's immediate instinct might be to focus on characters who exclusively use that weapon in their battles. And while it's easy to do that, there do exist characters who use chainsaws alongside other weapons in their games of origin to great effect. And I'm not talking about your Dead Risings or your Gears of Warses. I'm talking about him. The OG. The Slayer. Known by many names, from Doom Guy to Doom Marine and the Unchained Predator Jesus Christ among others, the Doom Slayer is the main protagonist of the Doom series and arguably one of the most recognizable video game characters of all time. Originally just an ordinary Marine, the Slayer was discharged due to his refusal to fire on innocent civilians in battle. Following this, he was placed on security at a Mars base that happened to contain a portal to hell, the UAC Phobos, and almost immediately found himself caught up in a life or death battle to protect Earth from an invading demon force from hell. After escaping hell and killing millions of demons, he found that Earth had already been successfully invaded, with his family and pet rabbit Daisy being among the billions of casualties. This gave him an excuse to continue fighting demons, taking the fight directly back to hell and eventually leaving himself behind there to keep any further demons from escaping. He was the immovable object, and the demons were certainly no unstoppable force. There's a lot more lore to this character that appears in Doom 2016 and Doom Eternal, but for the sake of brevity and not recapping those entire games, plus keeping the mystique up, we'll move on to the games themselves. Doom was a pioneering series in the FPS genre, being among the first ever games to feature this style of gameplay and graphics in its earliest installments. In the original Doom games, the Slayer is tasked with navigating complex mazes, finding weapons, and killing mountains of demons along his way. He's well known and respected for his unfaltering strength and resolve, being feared universally among both his fellow humans and especially demons, who view him as a sort of mythological figure of death. He single-handedly killed the entire forces of Hell on multiple occasions, and is all around the definition of a one-man army. His general loadout of weapons in any given game includes the likes of shotguns of the normal and super variety, chain guns, rocket launchers, the legendary BFG, and of course, for our purposes, chainsaws. Doom Slayer might be among the very first video game characters ever to allow the player to control a chainsaw in combat, and it's just as viscerally satisfying now as it was then. Just ram it into the demon's face and... Ah, so good. While the chainsaw is one of the Slayer's most basic armaments in the original game, basically being a replacement for his fists, its usefulness and brutality were ramped up to 11 in Doom 2016 and Eternal. Here, it's treated as a special attack with limited charges, allowing the player to instantly kill any demons at the press of a button for an immediate burst of ammo and health. About to die? Chainsaw. Running low on ammo? Chainsaw. Just feeling generally pissed off today? Chainsaw. The newer Doom games feature a lot of these limited resource generating abilities between the glory kills, flamethrower, crucible, and others, but the chainsaw is definitely my favorite. It adapts one of the series' classic weapons into a viscerally satisfying, incredibly useful utility that flows incredibly well into the series' new gameplay loop. It allows players to instantly refill on ammunition, while also simultaneously killing an important enemy and keeping the game's pace up. It's genius and perfectly implemented. Also, funnily enough, it canonically has no reason to be on Mars, and is 
is believed to have been smuggled in by Phobos workers. Hey, whatever you have to do, and at least it gave Doom Slayer a fun new weapon to use. Regardless, the chainsaw is one of the most standout signature weapons of one of gaming's most iconic heroes, and he uses it to its fullest extent in every iteration it appears in. You know what they say, rip and tear until it's done. Another chainsaw-heavy game that drew heavy criticism from general gaming media on release was James Gunn's Insuda 51 satirical zombie romp Lollipop Chainsaw. Now, this time it wasn't for the violence or gore or anything, it was for its overt sexual content and quote, objectification of women. And yeah, while that kind of stuff does exist in games and is pretty gross, to levy that argument at a game that's clearly so deliberately over the top that it's meant to be obvious satire is a little silly. Regardless, Lollipop Chainsaw is a game that you can easily sum up from its base image alone. A game where the player, as a cheerleader, kills zombies with a chainsaw. And while it's definitely as goofy or over the top as all of Suda's games, the main reason most people remember this game is for its main character. The titular lollipop-eating chainsaw wielder, Juliet Starling. Juliet is right up there with Bayonetta as an example of a sexualized yet badass female protagonist in gaming. A recently turned 18-year-old cheerleader at San Romero High School, Juliet goes throughout her days like any normal high school girl would, concerning herself with popularity, her image, and boys, but with one major sticking point. Her and her family are secretly zombie hunters. So, when on Juliet's 18th birthday, a massive zombie outbreak interrupts her plans, she takes up her personal bedazzled chainsaw with the intent on setting things right. Her boyfriend, Nick, is almost immediately bitten by the undead horde, ensuring infection. Luckily, Juliet has the perfect solution for this, in cutting off her boyfriend's head, resurrecting it with a magical spell, and wearing him like a sort of living charm for the rest of the game. In terms of personality, Juliet is characterized by a mix of stereotypically teenage goofiness and bubbliness, and the bloodthirst and vulgarity that most of Suda51's protagonists tend to demonstrate. She's a character that's so deeply rooted in the nature of what she's satirizing, that she pretty much takes every ditzy high school girl and sexualized female game protagonist up to 11, only for them to be immediately contradicted by her brutal fighting style and capability as a zombie killer. If you get the joke, she's a pretty badass character, all things considered. In terms of gameplay, Juliet fights primarily with a, can you believe it, chainsaw, in a style that's reminiscent of most of Suda's other games. A stylish, yet simple, combo-oriented hack-and-slash with a focus on finishers and upgrades. Juliet starts the game out with some simple combos and abilities, being able to do all sorts of stylish animations while effortlessly tearing through zombies, but the main focus is on the sparkle hunting mechanic, yes, that's actually what it's called, which activates and rewards the player whenever they manage to kill three or more zombies at once. Not only is this satisfying as all hell to chain together, but it's also another point towards this game's already sky-high style score. In addition, the player can fill a meter by killing zombies that grants them access to star soul power, which rainbows Julia up and augments her abilities even further. Throughout the game, she's also given a slew of new powers and abilities in the form of birthday gifts from her surviving friends and zombie hunting family. Like I said at the beginning of the century, Lollipop Chainsaw is a game that you can probably glean the entire nature of just from a cursory glance at it. An intensely stylish, tongue-in-cheek, satirical zombie-killing romp as a badass cheerleader. While she might not be the most disturbing or masculine chainsaw wielder, Julia has more than earned her stripes as one of gaming's best users of the weapon, and one of its most standout protagonists in general. Also, she's voiced by Tara Strong, which is a definite point in her favor. I'm not done screaming yet! Oh, it really fucking hurts, man! Oh! Jeez, so emo. I don't usually do this in these kinds of videos, but I wanted to give a quick honorable mention to Marcus Phoenix from Gears of War. He's probably the most iconic chainsaw user in video games, and my decision to exclude him comes down solely to there being more to him than just his chainsaw. Marcus is a complex character, despite what a lot of people say, and I feel like saddling him just with the title of Chainsaw Wielder might be a reductive way to represent him in one of these lists when he's capable of so much more in his home series. It'd be like putting Master Chief on a list of beam sword users. Yeah, he uses an energy sword, and it is a famous image, but he's got more going on than that. Regardless, consider Marcus an honorable mention for this list. Welcome to Delta Squad. Where are we going? Embry Square. Colonel Hoffman's waiting for us. Hoffman. Oh, shit. 
Now, if Marcus Phoenix can't make the list, we can at least include a character who's very similar to him in a lot of ways and give him the top spot, no less. Whereas every other character on this list either died, used more than chainsaws, or was a deliberate satirical design, my number one choice is a character who takes full advantage of the brutality his choice of weapon permits him and earnestly revels in it. Jack Kamen. Jack Kamen is the main character of Mad World, and also Anarchy Range, we'll be focusing on Mad World for this video, thank you. A hyper-violent bloodbath beat-em-up exclusive to the Wii. It's right alongside No More Heroes in the tier of perception-defining games on Nintendo hardware, and owes a lot of that to its premise and style. Mad World presents itself entirely in black and white, with exception to its blood, which is presented in full color and is everywhere. Its plot centers on the fictional Varigan City, which after a terrorist attack that encouraged people to kill each other for survival, became the site of a popular game game show known as Death Watch, where anyone in the city can fight and kill each other with the goal of becoming top-ranked in their brutality and winning large sums of money. Jack Kamen, a gruff man of few words, former Marine and police officer gone rogue, takes to the streets of Death Watch with a secret goal in mind, quickly becoming an audience favorite and one of the game's top stars. Throughout the game, Jack battles a wide variety of both enemies and bosses with the intent on finding out the true nature of Death Watch, all while reveling in the destruction and mayhem around him. While his story might be simpler than other characters on this list, his gameplay and sense of brutality make him an easy choice for the number one spot. The aim of the game in Mad World is to maximize the level of carnage and gore on each of the player's kills, so it's fortunate that Jack happens to rock a set of dual, retractable, wrist-mounted chainsaws that he calls the Gator Tooth. Jack can handily use this beastly weapon to carve through the armies of Death Watch goons in his wake, and also make easy work of the bosses around him. Jack wields his chainsaw so adeptly that he's able to cut mid-air bullets in half with it, can sever an enemy's arm while inside of a tornado, and can meticulously clip the wings off of a vampire in a few seconds, among other brutal applications. The amount of creative, visceral uses the developers were able to get out of such a conceptually simple weapon in such a short game is truly staggering. Mad World understands its concept and vision better than most other games I've ever seen, and takes full, earnest advantage of it. Jack also wields his chainsaw with expertise, dodging around and swinging it like other characters would a sword, but it's a fucking chainsaw. This is awesome in and of itself, but another big reason for Jack's placement at number one is, weirdly enough, the console he's featured on. Because this is a Wii game, with motion-controlled QTEs not unlike No More Heroes, the player gets an extra tangible sense of feedback and satisfaction in delivering these moves, and it never feels like a gimmick or repetitive. It's like I'm actually swinging a wrist-mounted chainsaw. For my money, this is the best, most creative use of a chainsaw in any video game, and turns what's already a stylish power fantasy into a truly one-of-a-kind game. While Jack Kamen doesn't have the complexity of Alex, the disturbing presence of Pigsy, the horror horror of Dr. Salvador, the icon status of Doomslayer, or the satirical bent of Juliet, he takes the number one spot because he's a character who's truly mastered the visceral potential of his weapon of choice, and uses it in just about every way imaginable. For such an unruly, unrealistic weapon, Jack Kamen makes it work. He's no champion of justice, and he's certainly not its bitch. Help me, or I'm gonna... <coughs> I don't help people. I kill them. Hey, you made it all the way through the video, thanks for watching. I'm sure you can probably tell by how the audio sounds compared to all of my other videos, but I finally went out of my way to pick up a proper XLR microphone setup, so my video should be sounding significantly better going into the future. If there's anything you'd like me to change about the audio on this video, let me know because I am still experimenting with it. But regardless, thanks for watching, and I hope y'all have a fantastic day before, during, and after. Thanks, and I'll catch y'all later. Y'all ready to live, y'all ready to die, let's go, let's go.